Good morning, everybody. Uh, this is Denise Gunter. I'm an antitrust partner at Nelson Mullins Riley and Scarborough. I'm in our Winston-Salem office, and it's my pleasure today to present to you the 2023 CMLS antitrust presentation, and I appreciate everybody joining. We've got now about 200 people on the line. I'm going to give folks just another 10 seconds or so to join so that we can make sure everybody uh, gets on. The session is being recorded, so if you have to drop off or you want to re-listen to it, it will be available and we'll make sure the slides are available to you as well. All right, so we've now got about uh, 200 people on the line, and uh, what I would like to cover with you today are four different things. Um, first, we'll have a brief introduction about uh, why we're here and what we'll cover. The next thing that we'll cover is, as I know you all are very well aware, there's been a lot of litigation, including a recent verdict in Missouri affecting the real estate industry. And we'll talk about some of those recent cases, including one that was just filed in federal court in South Carolina in early November. Uh, then what we'll do in the third part is try to put all of this together in a practical way to sum up what are things that CMLS as the organization needs to be watching out for and what do its members need to be watching out for and doing proactively in order to reduce potential antitrust risk. The uh, last area is going to be questions. I don't know uh, if we'll have time to answer questions during today's meeting. However, you can submit questions via the chat, so we will have those captured. You can also submit questions to CMLS uh, via email and they'll forward them to me. So I'll get them answered for you. And uh, the last slide that we'll show today, we'll have the address where to send that to. So don't worry if we don't get to questions today, there will be an opportunity to have questions answered later on. So today's meeting uh, is really to familiarize the CMLS memberships with the essentials of antitrust. Antitrust is a very complex topic. I've been practicing in this area of law for 34 years now, and every day I discover something new that I didn't know before. So my purpose today is obviously not to teach a class on antitrust, but just to simply give you some of the basics that will help you in your business. We'll talk about how the antitrust laws apply to the real estate industry. We'll talk about some of the penalties that individuals and organizations may face if they violate the antitrust laws. We'll also talk about CMLS's past experience with antitrust. CMLS has had uh, some experience with it before, and we'll talk about what that was about. And we'll talk about where we're at today. So the essentials are, as you may know, is the antitrust laws in the United States are designed to promote competition with the theory being that competition promotes lower prices, higher quality, and innovation. While uh, they're not really consumer protection laws as such, there's a whole nother body of law as consumer protection. They really are in many ways a type of law that is designed to protect consumers' interests. And we see, of course, in the cases that are being brought today, including the one that was uh, recently decided in Missouri, that it's really consumers and consumers' rights who, are, who seem to be at issue here. There is a body of federal antitrust law that apply across the country, and most states have their own antitrust laws some of which are based on the federal laws and some of which are different. For our purposes today, we're mainly concerned with just one of these laws, and that's what's called the Sherman Antitrust Act, specifically Section 1 of that act. That's an 1890 law, and what it prohibits is agreements that unreasonably restrain trade. 
you have to have for an agreement at least two or more parties. And that's essential because if it's an agreement between, say, a parent company and a wholly owned subsidiary or a company and one of its employees, then you don't get out of the gate with even the agreement. But in the case of a lot of the litigation that we're talking about now, which involve associations, that necessarily means there's two or more parties involved. And so that uh, concept of the agreement is more easily satisfied. Price fixing is one of the classic examples of uh, a Section 1 Sherman Act antitrust issue. So let's take a hypothetical. Let's assume that you have two separate uh, real estate brokerage firms and they agree that they will never allow their agents to accept commissions lower than 6%. So that would be a price fixing agreement. And let's say they never wrote it down. It's just oral agreements between two brokers in charge, nothing ever in writing. That's still a violation of the antitrust laws. You don't have to have an agreement in writing. You just need to prove that it exists. And we'll talk in a minute how they go about proving that. Another essential concept and one that's very common in the litigation that uh, is so prevalent right now is what's called a tying arrangement. And that's essentially where a seller forces or requires a buyer to purchase additional products or services that that buyer may not want or need or might prefer to buy someplace else in order to get the products or services they really do want. And we see that coming up in the litigation that is ongoing right now in the real estate industry, because one of the theories that the plaintiff's lawyers are advocating and pushing is that sellers are being forced in order to sell their homes, they're being forced to hire or pay for buyer's agents. And the sellers claim that they don't want that, they don't need buyer's agent services. And so this is not fair, it's not right to them and they're being forced into a tying arrangement. So the key to both of those theories, the price fixing theory and the tying arrangement theory is that there is an agreement in, in restraint of trade and it's the plaintiff's argument that that agreement unreasonably restrained trade. All agreements restrain trade to some degree or another. The question that the antitrust laws are trying to solve for is whether it's an unreasonable restraint of trade. And that can often be a very complex question. So as I mentioned a moment ago, agreements can take a lot of different forms. They can take the form of a written contract, but they can also be oral understandings. For example, in the hypothetical that I gave you just a moment ago, if you had two brokers in charge who are communicating amongst each other, they never write anything down, but they agree that they will not allow uh, their agents to accept less than a 6% commission, that is an agreement, assuming it can be established. And it can be established in a lot of different ways, such as whether or not these two brokers in charge have the opportunity to meet with each other? Were they ever seen together? Is there any record of them having met? So it can be pieced together in a lot of different ways. What's central to some of the litigation that we're seeing uh, now is that plaintiffs are relying on not just contracts, written agreements, but they're relying on rules, codes of conduct and bylaws in which an association and specifically National Association of Realtors requires certain things and the members agree to comply with those rules or requirements as a condition of membership. So if you read the complaints in these cases, you'll see a lot of heavy reliance on NAR's uh, rules and regulations, its code of conduct, its code of ethics and things of that nature. So an organization like NAR, which is a trade association and membership organizations, which bring together separate parties are often prime targets for these section one cases because they already have sort of baked into them the presence of two or more entities that are, are capable 
of conspiring. So how the antitrust laws apply to real estate, they can apply in many, many different ways. But I think our focus today is mainly on what we're seeing in the litigation. And as we've seen, a very key focus is on NAR's adversary commission rule. And according to the plaintiffs, these rules constitute price fixing and tying. They say it's price fixing because NAR requires sellers to compensate buyer's agents. And they say it's tying because the seller is required to pay a buyer's agent, even though the seller doesn't want or need the buyer's agent. And you may say, but wait a minute, isn't this all disclosed to sellers when they're uh, buying, when they're selling property? It's all disclosed in the contracts. Nothing is kept from them. And that is true. It is disclosed. However, what the plaintiff's lawyers are arguing, and apparently successfully, at least in the Missouri case that resulted in the uh, recent verdict, is that the process really is not transparent. It's not very clear to people. They're not aware of how much is being paid to these buyer's agents. We're also seeing that they're taking, the plaintiffs are taking information that NAR has shared with its membership in terms of negotiating commissions downward. They're taking that information really out of context to show that people are being discouraged and forced into arrangements that they really don't want to be in. So whether we agree or disagree with that, that is the portrait that the plaintiffs are painting, that it is an unfair system and it's anti-consumer. They're relying on economic data, which shows that in other industrialized nations, uh, home sellers are paying much less commissions than uh, their counterparts are in the United States. I think NAR's response to that is that it's not an apples to apples comparison. You really can't draw a, a definitive comparison between what's going on in a foreign country versus what's going on in the United States. There are lots of different factors at play, but be that as it may, that is the argument that the plaintiffs are making. To me, when I read these complaints, what I see is not so much antitrust, but just a, a portrait of, of what plaintiffs claim is a very unfair anti-consumer situation. The penalties for antitrust violations can basically be broken down into two buckets. One is the civil side, and that's the litigation that's going on uh, now, mostly involving NAR. And then there's the criminal side, and the criminal side can only be brought by the government. Specifically on the federal side, it's the United States Department of Justice. Uh, then you can also have state attorney generals who have criminal prosecution authority. So on the civil side, what we see are damages. And in antitrust, when a plaintiff is awarded damages under the law, that's automatically tripled or what we lawyers call trebling. Uh, then there's also injunctive relief, which is an order prohibiting certain conduct or requiring uh, the defendant to do something. There's something also called declaratory reef, relief, which is essentially a declaration that the law was violated. And then on top of that, you've got an award of plaintiff's attorney's fees, pre and post judgment interest, and costs. So you can tell right away that this is enormous, right? Um, triple the damages. So as we'll talk in a moment, the verdict in Missouri in the Burnett case, when all is said and done, that becomes $5 billion plus unless it's reversed or reduced. And on top of that, in addition to the $5 billion is plaintiff's attorney's fees, which will be extraordinary, post-judgment interest, pre and post-judgment interest on the verdict, and then costs, which would be things like all the depositions that were taken. Someone has to pay for that. So the costs can skyrocket in this type of litigation. On the criminal side, the government can seek to impose fines. They can uh, impose disgorgement of profits that are attributable to illegal conduct. 
and most seriously, individuals can face imprisonment for antitrust violations. There's something else too that's not always easily quantifiable, but the time, the time and the uh, emotional drama that goes on in dealing with these types of cases is extraordinary. The investigation that goes on, for example, when the government investigates a suspected antitrust violation, those can go on for quite some time. The amount of money that gets spent without even any lawsuit or litigation being filed can be extraordinary. So given that the penalties are so extraordinary, and difficult and damaging to individuals and organizations, there's a premium placed on trying to stay on the right side of the law. I should also mention another form of non-economic damage, one that we can't put a dollar sign in front of necessarily, is the damaging publicity that people suffer, that the industry as a whole suffers because the plaintiffs are masterful at painting a portrait of what they see as a very unfair system. So as I mentioned at the outset, CMLS has had some of its own experience with antitrust. Uh, back in 2008, the antitrust division of the Department of Justice brought a case against uh, CMLS uh, it was a civil case in nature, and it was resolved about a year after it was filed. The complaint essentially alleged that some of the rules that CMLS had at the time were anti-competitive, and they violated Section 1 of the Sherman Act. And what the government was looking for was injunctive relief. It was not a criminal prosecution. They were not seeking monetary damages. They simply wanted these rules gone. Um, although it wasn't alleged specifically in the complaint, during the course of the case, the Department of Justice also took issue with CMLS's initiation fee, which uh, DOJ believed was too high and not reflective of CMLS's actual costs. And so what happened there is that a final judgment was entered in which CMLS agreed not to charge initiation fees that were more than its costs, and secondly, CMLS agreed to revise and or eliminate certain rules, and that was done. There's no admission of guilt or error in that consent agreement. And what happened there is a very common situation. When the government arrives and conducts an investigation and threatens to bring a lawsuit, there's a high motivation to try to come to an agreement if possible because of the extraordinary time and cost involved. It doesn't mean that the organization admits guilt. Uh, it's not a court finding of guilt or error, but it is a way to move on and to try to put uh, the issue behind the organization. So a consent agreement is something that happens very commonly uh, in antitrust when the government brings litigation against an organization. That consent agreement or final judgment uh, had a 10-year lifespan on it, and it was entered in August of 2009, and so it expired in August of 2019. After the case was resolved, the government brought a motion to enforce the judgment because it felt like CMS had not reduce the initiation fees as much as the government would have liked. And so an additional settlement was brought on top of the original one. So all in, the case lasted about two years from the time of inception to the time of resolution. And as I say, this consent decree expired in 2019. Uh, there was one additional matter some years before that <clears throat> where CMLS was faced with another court case involving a rule that uh, excluded a broker who worked from his home, and CMLS was ordered uh, not to exclude that broker. So uh, that was another example back in the 80s. So let's look at what we're doing today. Just because the consent decree expired four years ago does not mean that CMLS is exempt from the antitrust laws. Quite to the contrary, CMLS 
takes its obligations under the antitrust laws very seriously, which is why they've retained my law firm and which is why we're here today. Uh, we comply with all laws that are applicable to our operations, including antitrust, and we take our obligations seriously, and so we expect our members to do likewise. CMLS can control its own behavior, but obviously we cannot control what each member is doing, but we do feel that we have a responsibility to make you aware of what's going on in the industry and steps that you can take to reduce potential risk. So this presentation, although CMLS is not legally obligated to do this, is an example, I would say, of our very serious intent to comply with the laws so that we promote awareness of key issues and lit litigation developments that impact you. So most of the litigation that I've seen stems from NARS rules or rules that are promulgated by similar organizations. We, as you know, at CMLS have our own rules. We don't uh, necessarily follow or are bound by NAR, although we obviously watch what we're doing. We believe that CMLS's rules, including its bylaws and its agreements are antitrust compliant. I'd now like to shift focus to some of the cases uh, and share some of my perspective about what's going on. And there's four cases in particular that I'd like to talk about. The first is the Burnett case. That was the very large, uh, uh, shocking, I would say, verdict in Missouri. The next is the Morrell case, which is pending in Illinois, which will probably go to trial sometime next year. The next case is NAR versus the United States of America, which is NAR's own complaint against the United States Department of Justice. And the last one is called Burton versus NAR. And that's a case that was fire, filed about a week after the verdict was announced in the Burnett case, and it was fi uh, filed in Spartanburg. So it, it's close to home. It's in very early days, but it's definitely one to watch. I do want to make clear that these cases uh, are by no means the entire universe of litigation pending out there against uh, the real estate industry, principally involving rules of one kind or another. There are many, many cases. I read about new ones, it seems like, almost every day. As you might expect, with a verdict like the Burnett case being so large, that is very attractive to potential plaintiff's lawyers. And so uh, we can expect to see more cases. There were other cases filed around the same time as Burnett. Uh, those are progressing through the courts, uh, but they all seem to be of a similar variety. Complaints about rules that are uh, in plaintiff's eyes, disadvantageous to sellers. So the first one, of course, is Burnett, and that was filed back in 2019. And that started off its life uh, called Sitzer versus NAR. The plaintiff named Sitzer uh, dropped out, uh, but the case is still referred to as Sitzer Burnett. So I may refer to it as that uh, from time to time. So these plaintiffs are uh, home sellers who listed their homes on one of four MLSs. And the defendants are NAR, Realogy, Home Services, BHH, HSF, Remax, and Keller Williams. And so what the case boils down to is that the home sellers unfairly pay commissions of buyers brokers in violation of Section 1 of the Sherman Act. And how it gets to that is, again, according to the complaint, according to plaintiffs, uh, the uh, defendants have agreed through NAR that they will adopt the uh, rules that NAR has, which says, in essence, a unilateral offer will be made from uh, seller agent to buyer agent. And even though there's not a specific percentage or a specific dollar amount of what that compensation will look like, 
the argument that has been made in this case is that that's an agreement that fixes prices and also is a tying arrangement because in their view, it forces sellers to pay for a service that they don't want or need. So this case was certified as a class action, meaning it represents a class of buyers, not just the individuals who are specifically named as plaintiffs in the case, but a class of probably thousands, I don't know the total headcount, but thousands of people who bought home or sold homes from uh, the beginning date to, uh, to the present, frankly. Uh, so it's multiple years and uh, they sold their homes through uh, one of the brokerage firms that are listed as defendants. The case went all the way to trial. And I wanna pause there for a moment because and that in and of itself is a fairly unusual event because these cases are so complicated. They're so difficult. They're so expensive. They involve, as you might imagine, a cast of thousands in terms of lawyers. There's expert witnesses of all kinds in terms of economists, real estate professionals. Uh, it is a, a pretty extraordinary event for a case like this to go to trial. I don't know all the ins and outs because I don't represent any of the parties in the case, but I assume that over the course of four years, the case having been filed back in the spring of 2019, there were probably settlement discussions along the way. And in fact, some defendants have or are in process right now of attempting to settle with these plaintiffs. But NAR would not settle. NAR has made a determination that the fight is worth it. And so they decided that the uh, law and the facts were on their side and that they were willing to uh, take the case to trial. It could also well be the case, and again, I don't know all the details, but it could be that plaintiff's demands were so extraordinary that it was just not within the realm of possibility to uh, to try to settle this matter. So it went to trial. And as you can imagine, if you've ever been involved in litigation or know anyone who has been, um, the prospect of going in front of a jury can be very, very frightening. Uh, because at that point, even though you may have hired the best lawyers to do uh, the work that you're very you know proud of, you stand behind, you don't know what will happen. So you are taking a gamble and you are taking a risk. Uh, it's a very calculated risk because I'm sure the lawyers on both sides knew what the strengths and weaknesses of their respective positions were, uh, but it's still a risk and you can never be entirely certain what will happen. And so what we saw there is a jury of eight people agreed that uh, the law had been violated, that each defendant was responsible for this violation. And the verdict was approximately $1.8 billion. So that is extraordinary, as I think we can all agree. And because of the antitrust laws, that verdict is automatically tripled. Now, that doesn't mean that NAR or the other defendants are writing a check as we speak. Quite to the contrary, uh, there's still a long way to go in this case. But as you can see, we're talking about almost $5.4 billion in damages. And as I mentioned a few slides back, that doesn't include the extras that get added on in antitrust, like plaintiff's attorney's fees, like pre and post judgment interest like costs. So that's probably, I, I don't even want to venture to guess how much that is, but many millions of dollars will be added uh, on top of that. Um, let me go back to just one thing I clicked too soon on something. Um, so what happened, you know, after that, um, you know, NAR is holding firm. I'm sure they're very concerned about this verdict. As you know, their CEO left his position and an interim has been brought in, um, but they are holding firm, at least publicly. They uh, think the verdict was wrong. 
they're going to appeal it. Um, and I think they're probably right that it will probably be several years before the case is finally resolved. It could settle. Uh, that often happens after a verdict like this. Plaintiffs, uh, you know, face the reality that they have uh, another, they have a long road to go because the defendants are not going to write a check right then and there for uh, $5.4 billion and change. Uh, so they have some incentive to see if there's any room uh, to negotiate a settlement. Likewise, defendants do as well. And some of the def defendants in the case, I'm un I understand, are in fact in the process of trying to reach a settlement. So the final outcome of Burnett is unknown, but I think we can all agree that that is a, a shocking outcome. Uh, so what happens now? Uh, as I said, uh, there's still a long way to go and the legal process is a very complicated one now. There will be motions that will be filed with the trial judge uh, asking the trial judge to set aside the verdict or reduce it. Uh, the parties, the defendants will also appeal to what's called uh, the Eighth Circuit. That's the federal court of appeals that sits uh, over the trial courts in Missouri. And that appeal will take a long time. Um, probably a year or more would be my best guesstimate because there will be extensive briefs that will get filed. There will be uh, arguments that the lawyers will make to the judges at that court. So it will be a very long process. And even after that, there could still be further uh, activity. The case could get sent back to the trial judge for further work. Uh, the case could uh, be reversed in its entirety. The case might get appealed further to the United States Supreme Court. So uh, the final answer on Burnett is uh, not written yet, but obviously, you know, everybody who pays attention to this industry is, is watching this case closely. Um, <clears throat> what's interesting is, again, I think NARS public position. And what they have told the membership, if you look online, is that they don't believe that people need to do anything differently as a result of that verdict. And I think that's a literally true statement because that verdict doesn't apply, for example, to South Carolina. Uh, none of the plaintiffs are in South Carolina, to my knowledge. Uh, the case had nothing to do with South Carolina. But still, it's something that I think we all pay attention and to and try to see what lessons potentially might we learn from litigation like this. Do we face risks such as the defendants in uh, the Burnett case um, faced? NAR also says, you know, we can urge membership to continue to emphasize the value that you continue to provide uh, to your clients, that we're providing a valuable service, that we're transparent, and we offer market-driven pricing for consumers. So I think the message that NAR is sharing is we're holding the line. Again, that's not binding on CMLS or any of CMLS's members because we're not NAR and we have our own rule. But still, I think it's, it's instructive to pay attention to the developments in the case. The next case is even more frightening than uh, Burnett, if that's even possible, and that's the Morrell case. And again, that's uh, brought against NAR and some of the same defendants that we saw in um, uh, the Burnett case, Realogy, Home Services, BHH, HSF, Long and Foster, Remax, and Keller Williams. Very similar to uh, Burnett, uh, the case has been going on for four plus years. Um, what's interesting about Morrell is, uh, among many things, frankly, is that it's a bigger case. Uh, it covers not just four MLSs, as was the case in Burnett, but 20. And these MLSs are across the country. I don't think anyone in South Carolina is involved, although I know two MLSs in North Carolina have been involved in that case. Um, the allegation is very much at, like we saw in Burnett. Uh, in fact, Morell uh, is actually a little bit older case than Burnett. 
So Morel may have uh, started the template, if you will. But the theory is that home sellers unfairly pay commissions of buyers brokers in violation of Section 1 of the Sherman Act. <clears throat> and so the class uh, certification, again, like Burnett, the case was certified as a class. And that took a long time, almost four years, to make its way uh, through the courts. But last March, the court determined that the case could be certified as a class action. And so the class consists of all persons who paid a broker commission since March 6, 2015, in connection with the sale of residential real estate listed on one of the uh, 20 covered MLSs. Again, I don't know the precise headcount, but we're talking thousands of people in this class. So similar to Burnett, the complaint seeks an order with a declaration that the defendants violated the law. It wants an injunction. It's seeking damages, attorney's fees, and pre and post judgment interest. The case is still in front of the trial judge with a lot of pretrial maneuvering, a lot of arguments amongst the lawyers, a lot of motions. The last activity I saw on the docket, I think as of late last week, is that they were back in front of the judge to talk about uh, whether the case should be slowed down or speeded up in light of the Burnett uh, verdict. Uh, with some folks taking the position that we need to see a little bit more where the dust settles with Burnett before we take this next case to trial and others, including the plaintiffs, I think pushing back on that saying, absolutely not. We've been doing this now four plus years. We need to get on with it. My best guess, based on a comment that the judge made at a hearing recently, is that the case will be tried probably late in 2024. I think the parties still have a lot of work to do, um, and so it's not quite ready. So that's stay tuned. But um, as I mentioned, I find Morell even more frightening than Burnett because it is so large. The class is larger. Um, and because it is so big, the damages, if they are awarded, and I want to emphasize if because there's no determination at this point and just because a jury reached a conclusion in Missouri does not mean that a jury in Illinois federal court is going to reach a same or similar conclusion. Each case turns on its own facts so we can't make an assumption uh, one way or the other but uh, just given the size of the Morrell class uh, the damages would be larger if they're awarded. And some estimates that I have seen estimate that with trebling, it could be as much as $54 billion. And I don't know if that's at the maximum end or middle midpoint or low end estimate. That was just an estimate I saw recently by some pundit about what they thought possible damages could be. And if that were to happen, uh, obviously devastating uh, and don't know what that spells for the industry uh, if that were to happen. Surely that verdict would be appealed. But again, that creates a dynamic where uh, NAR and other defendants, I think, have a strong incentive, particularly in light of the Burnett verdict, to think about whether there is any pathway, any reasonable way to settle this case. Again, I'm not involved in the case, so I can't speak to details or the dynamics that are going on, but it could also very well be the case, and it would not surprise me at all if plaintiff's lawyers, because of the extraordinary result in Burnett, um, are emboldened and more, de more uh, desirous than ever of pursuing Morrell. I would suspect that to be strongly the case, and so defendants would face, I believe, a large up, up, uh, uphill battle to try to settle, although you could never say never. I'm sure the lawyers who are handling the Morrell case are looking very closely at what transpired in Burnett, reading transcripts, looking at the evidence, talking to witnesses, talking to lawyers to figure out what happened and what can they do better and differently this time around.
so the next case I'll talk about um, is the one that NAR has brought against the government, which is very interesting because this case puts to test the proposition about when is a settlement agreement really final and could the uh, deal be uh, busted up, so to speak, later on. And what happened there is that the Department of Justice Antitrust Division had been investigating NAR and had issued subpoenas. And these subpoenas are called uh, by the acronym CID, or Civil Investigative Demands, to NAR regarding two rules, participation and clear cooperation policy. And these uh, civil investigative demands are usually very, very broad subpoenas asking for documents going back for many, many years. They're asking for emails going back many, many years. So the amount of work that goes on in trying to respond to one of these CIDs is really, really significant, very time consuming, and as you would expect, very costly. And that's before the government files a lawsuit. That's to see, is there a reason to file a lawsuit? And so <clears throat> during the process of responding to the CID, NAR and the Department of Justice reached a settlement in November of 2020, in which the DOJ agreed to in end the investigation and withdraw the CIDs. So as typically happens, the government files a case and immediately at the same time also files a proposed settlement agreement in the form of a consent judgment with the court. And that goes through a process where it's up on the record for public review. Um, anyone can file comments against it. <clears throat> and assuming the court uh, decides that the settlement agreement is fair and appropriate, then the case will be put to bed. There was a lot of argument and negotiation between the lawyers while the um, case was in the process of being settled about a reservation of rights clause, where essentially the DOJ was reserving its right to pursue action against NAR in the future. And there was a lot of negotiation back and forth between NAR's lawyers and the Department of Justice legal team and the NAR lawyers refused to agree to the reservation of rights clause. Finally, they got to a point of settlement where both parties uh, found the agreement satisfactory for their purposes. So the agreement was signed and filed with the court. A few months later, DOJ contacts NAR and says, we wanna make a change. And as you might expect, uh, NAR, uh, said, absolutely not. We will not agree to a change. Now, interesting here, timing. The settlement was reached at the end of the Trump administration, and DOJ called NAR back after the Biden administration had taken office. And so you can envision a situation where one administration is trying to wrap up litigation and a new administration comes in, which has an announced uh, very vigorous antitrust enforcement policy. And so again, I'm not involved, so I can't speak to specifics, but I can surmise that new leadership at DOJ took a look at this, knows the direction the Biden administration is going in as far as antitrust is concerned and said, hey, wait a minute, we're not sure if this is appropriate, we wanna make a change. And there starts a chain of events. NAR refused, there was negotiation back and forth, but ultimately NAR said, no way, we're not agreeing to change this settlement. So DOJ did something um, pretty extraordinary, uh, which is they withdrew from the settlement, publicly withdrew uh, in July of, two, of 2021, few days after that, they issued a brand new subpoena or CID to NAR and NAR said, we're not responding to it. And in fact, they filed uh, a lawsuit in uh, federal court in Washington, DC. So the question now is whether the investigation can be reopened. Uh, NAR says, look, we settled with you government and you said you would leave us alone. We did what we were supposed to do. Um, 
and you you have it. So uh, you need to back off and withdraw these CI, this CID to us. DOJ's argument, by contrast, is uh, no, we didn't agree. Um, we closed a particular investigation. We didn't agree to leave you alone forever. So that's the dispute that is framed in front of the courts. The district court judge agreed with NAR and the DOJ appealed to the appellate court in Washington. And they were in front of the appellate court in Washington just last Friday with lot and the judges had lots of questions, hard to tell uh, where their heads may be at that uh, at this point. Uh, we won't know, the decision uh, won't come, I'm imagining for many months, probably in 2024, but <clears throat> they're on their own timetable, so who knows. Uh, and it's very possible the case could uh, go on to the U.S. Supreme Court because it, it presents a very uh, interesting issue about whether the government and, and, and under what circumstances can the government back out of a settlement. The last major case I want to talk about before we get to some of our practical tips is uh, the Burton case. And that one, as I mentioned, was filed about a week after the Burnett verdict. And that shows you <clears throat> in real time how the system operates, if you will, in terms of big verdict announced, plaintiffs are gonna move to the next, uh, the next target. And so while I assume that plaintiffs uh, didn't just wake up on November 1st and say, hey, let's file a lawsuit in South Carolina. They were probably working on this uh, before November 6th. Obviously the result in Burnett was a catalyst to getting that lawsuit filed when it was filed. That case was filed in federal court in Spartanburg and the plaintiff there is a home seller in Spartanburg who alleges that the defendants conspired to impose and enforce an anti-competitive restraint that requires home sellers to pay the buyer's broker and pay an inflated amount. So it's the same story, basically. Some of the allegations, if you did a side-by-side -side comparison between Burnett and Morrell and Burton, they all, they all seem to follow one another. Uh, the defendants, many of the same defendants, NAR and Keller Williams, no MLS or any individual agent is a defendant, uh, although the complaint alleges that MLSs and their members participated as co-conspirators in these alleged antitrust violations. And again, the crux is the adversary commission rule that's on page 39 of the current edition of the NAR handbook. And that, according to these plaintiffs, violates section one of the Sherman Act. Similar to the other cases, declaration that there's a violation of law, a permanent injunction ending the ACR damages, and of course, if awarded, they would get attorney's fees and costs. So this case is also seeking class action status, and that has not been decided yet, and that will be many months before it is decided that it will, in fact, be a class action. But what the plaintiffs want to do is have a class certified that is all persons who from November 6, 2019 through the present used a listing broker affiliated with Keller Williams Realty in the sale of a home listed on one of the MLSs that comprise a real estate market in the district of South Carolina. So CMLS is not directly involved. It's not named as a defendant. It is possible, although we certainly don't know right now that if the case progresses, that CMLS may receive a subpoena for documents and testimony from the plaintiffs. Um, the case is in the very early stages right now. It was only filed in uh, early November. So there's been no real activity so far. I don't think even the defendants have um, identified who their legal representation is at this point. So it's not clear uh, you know, what next steps will happen, but it will be, I would assume, similar to most of these other cases, which are that typically the defendants will file what's called a motion to dismiss the case. Uh, in which they seek the court uh, uh, order to throw the case out before it goes anywhere, before it goes into discovery. Uh, that's the typical 
process. That can often be a very tough road to hoe for the defendants because the uh, rules essentially require the court to give plaintiffs every benefit of the doubt at this stage. And so uh, that could be very hard to do, although not impossible. Uh, we'll see what happens. But it will be, you know, probably, um, you know, six months to a year, I'm going to guess, before we see major activity in the case. If the defendants move to dismiss and the court decides that it will not grant the motion to dismiss, then the case will go into what's called discovery. So that will mean documents, depositions, potentially subpoenas to third parties, uh, and the case will go on. There'll be a motion to certify this class that the plaintiffs seek to represent. So that will uh, be many months. That has its own discovery process because we're, the court is trying to understand whether uh, it's reasonable to have a class action and whether the named plaintiffs are uh, appropriate representatives for the class. And so that has its own discovery and briefing schedule. So similar to the way some of these other cases have played out, you're looking at potentially a multi-year process. There could, of course, be a settlement along the way, um, and we'll just have to wait and see. For NARS purposes, of course, it's a very delicate dance because they have all of these uh, cases pending. So if they were to resolve one case, what does that do to some of these other cases? So uh, again, CMLS is not NAR. That's not our problem to solve. However, it's very interesting to watch to see what's, uh, what their uh, process is and what we can learn uh, from what's going on. So now let's try to put it all together. Um, and first I'll focus on uh, CMLS. Um, and I wanna emphasize because when you read things in uh, press or social media, um, you can get an impression that uh, the sky is falling. Um, and Burnett and the other cases don't directly impact CMLS because CMLS is not them and we have our own rules, which we think are antitrust compliant. Um, our rules, and I would say our rule 14B in particular, uh, is sort of the opposite of what I see the plaintiffs challenging in uh, these cases, because our uh, approach is to emphasize transparency. We don't uh, mandate rates, we don't suggest, we don't demand. Uh, it is a transaction between uh, the seller and the seller's agent to negotiate. Um, and so we feel our, our process is a bit different. Um, the other thing I want to emphasize is that uh, these cases do not stand for the proposition that uh, the practice of sellers compensating buyers agents has been ruled illegal. I don't think you can, uh, especially the stage Burnett is at now, there's been a verdict, but still many miles to go. You can't necessarily extrapolate from that, that the practice of seller's agents compensating buyer's agents is uh, has been ruled illegal in all jurisdictions. It has not. Uh, the overall practice of compensating other agents has not been ruled illegal in all jurisdictions. So I think we have to uh, look at things in context and not jump to conclusions. I think we can take lessons and learn uh, things and study these cases and try to benefit from uh, what the learning is there, but we need to be careful and not act hastily or rashly in light of what we read um, in the headlines. Um, what I would say probably most important is what we're doing today, which is having heightened awareness. We're paying attention to it. We're being cautious. We're asking appropriate questions. Um, that's why CMLS has involved me to uh, be a sounding board, to react, to answer questions. But again, I would urge folks to not act precipitously just because they read something or they heard something. 
each case is its own unique set of circumstances. And just because something happened in one case doesn't mean it's going to happen in all cases. So we need to look at the whole picture. All rules and regulations can potentially restrain competition, but the question is whether they unreasonably restrain competition. I suppose I'm biased because I represent defendants more than I do plaintiffs, but I'm having a hard time just as an experienced antitrust practitioner understanding why uh, these rules are deemed to restrain, or the rules at least that were at issue at NAR are deemed to restrain competition. Um, what we do at CMLS uh, is we review rules and bylaws regularly and consult with counsel. I'm brought into conversations to understand if this happens, what are the implications of that, pros and cons. I think it's important and healthy to um, look holistically at situations and not just assume because a practice has been in place for every num for a long time or that we've always done something that that is always the right way it may or may not be a satisfactory answer and that's part of my role as counsel which is to question to ask appropriate questions Another thought that just comes to mind, and I honestly don't know the answer, but I wonder, and uh, I suppose NAR has explored this at the federal level, uh, whether there's legislative efforts, uh, either at the federal level or more locally, uh, that could be helpful here to uh, untie this knot, the tension that seems to exist and the um, suspicion that it seems to be cast unfairly on real estate, that brokers are not acting in clients' best interest. That's a theme that I see running throughout these cases, that brokers will not uh, put buyers' interests ahead of their own interests, that they're only thinking about their own economic interests. And I think that's an unfair characterization and perception. Uh, and it has injected a, an element of suspicion uh, that I think is really, really unfortunate and demeans the hard work that real estate professionals do every day. So looking at it you know, from CMLS member perspectives, I wanna emphasize a few things. First of all, each of you as a member has an obligation to follow the antitrust laws. Again, CMLS will do everything in its power to make sure that its house is in order, but we can't uh, obviously be, be with our members 24 seven. And so we want you, and that's why we're here today, to be cognizant of the antitrust laws. Um, Another thing I would emphasize is just use common sense and professionalism. What we see time and again in these cases is communications, whether it's emails, text messages, uh, you name it, that are taken out of context, uh, blown up and made into something that they are not. Um, and sometimes that's because people are careless in their language uh, with things. And so a great, uh, test is, would you want this on the front cover of the newspaper uh, if you're sending a text message? Uh, and I'm not just talking about antitrust, I'm talking about all types of communications in which you might engage in your business to just be mindful because uh, that can turn into something that you never intended. For example, in, in these cases that are brought against NAR, the NAR script explaining why uh, agents should uh, educate uh, their clients who ask about reducing commissions, why that's not in the client's best interest. That script has been flipped in, on its head and turned into, a, into an exhibit in the case, showing that, see, that proves the plaintiff's allegations that uh, they're not acting in your best interest. And so you can see the script was not intended to do that, but that's how it's being used uh, by the plaintiffs. As we mentioned at the outset, an anti-competitive agreement can be reached even when there's nothing in writing. And the way plaintiffs stitch together their cases is through all manner of sources, emails, text messages, 
phone records, minutes of meetings. They're looking at expense records to see whether uh, people got together, were they at a trade association meeting together? Did they meet for drinks after work? They're looking at rules and bylaws. And so uh, all manner of things stitched together to come up with something. I do think NAR's point about emphasizing value uh, is really, really critical. Um, you know, I can know from my own personal experience, having recently gone through a real estate transaction for uh, my husband and I, how valuable it was to have a, a, a skilled agent representing us as buyers. Um, and so communicating that value, it may not save the day ultimately if somebody's inclined to bring a lawsuit, but you do bring value. You are the professionals. You do know what you're doing. And so people entering into the world of real estate transactions uh, without professional representation can sometimes, as you probably all know, uh, fall into situations that are very unfortunate and perhaps could have been avoided if they had uh, competent representation. So I do think that message is really worth emphasizing. Another thing I would say, um, and not to be pessimistic, but you know, check insurance coverage, check your uh, directors and officers coverage, check your errors and omission coverage, and see if you have coverage for antitrust or competition issues. Some people do, some people don't. Uh, the coverage, not surprisingly, is pretty expensive, uh, but you know, in this environment, it may uh, be worth considering making that investment um, in case there is litigation. Last but not least, I think it's always appropriate to ask questions. Don't feel like it's a dumb question. Don't be afraid to ask questions, whether that's a question you're posing to CMLS or if you're an agent for a brokerage firm asking uh, your leadership at the brokerage firm, uh, you know, is this okay? Can I do this? I've heard about this case. What does it mean? I think it's appropriate to ask questions and have a dialogue and try to get answers that make sense. So last but not least, and I see we're just slightly over time, so thank you for bearing with me. What I see ahead uh, in 2024, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the last chapter is yet to be written in Burnett. There's many miles to go. Uh, there will be a trial, I suspect, in the Morell case late in 24. More litigation, um, you know, it, it is inevitable. You have cases that are ongoing right now. You have cases that will be filed, I think, because the Burnett uh, verdict is incentive to plaintiffs. Um, the Burton case, we will see developments there, uh, including, I would suspect, a motion to dismiss the case. The question that none of us really knows the answers to uh, is, is the landscape really going to change? And I would say not in the short term. I think we're still a ways from uh, any change, if any. Uh, NAR, of course, has a particular view on this and they point out, and I believe it is correct, that the Burnett verdict itself does not require a change in the rules. And I would say that's literally true at this time. We'll see what happens further on uh, in that case. And again, the way I look at Burnett is something to watch, lessons to learn. Uh, we can always learn ways to do things better and differently. So while I don't think the Bur Burnett verdict, uh, it's certainly not binding on anything going on in South Carolina, it is again instructive. Um, and as I mentioned, keep emphasizing your message of value. Uh, I believe it is true and I believe it's something that people need to hear. So uh, we will take questions. Unfortunately, we don't have time to do it live today, but if you've submitted questions in the chat, we'll hold on to them. Uh, also, uh, please submit questions via email to CMLS, and you'll see that email address at support at columbiamls.com. Again, that's support at columbiamls.com. And we ask that you please do so by Monday, December 11th, and uh, CMLS will then forward questions to me. 
uh, for response. So again, I thank you very much for your time and attention. I hope you found this presentation beneficial and I wish you uh, happy holidays. Thank you again. Bye-bye.